If you ever get a chance to visit the Louvre in Paris, head past Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. It's worth a look, but it is rather small. And don't leave without seeing the Code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the sixth king of the ancient kingdom of Babylon. He lived around 500 years before Moses was born and his code, written in about 1770 BC, is one of the first sets of laws or commands in recorded history. Inscribed on a stone slab in the Akkadian language that stands just about two meters high, the punishments it sets out for law-breaking are pretty harsh. Here's just one example. If a man destroys the eye of another man, they shall destroy his eye. If one breaks a man's bone, they shall break his bone. If one destroys the eye of a freeman, or breaks the bone of a freeman, he shall pay one manner of silver. If one destroys the eye of a man's slave, or breaks the bone of a man's slave, he shall pay one half his price. If a man knocks out the tooth of a man of his own rank, they shall knock out his tooth. If one knocks out the tooth of a freeman, he shall pay one third a manner of silver. Now, for any and everyone who knows the Bible, all of this sounds pretty familiar, except that Moses' version, written half a millennium later and recorded in the Old Testament, is making a subtly different point. See if you can spot it. You are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Although it sounds similar, Moses has taken a giant moral step forward. The Code of Hammurabi is hierarchical. A Babylonian citizen's eyes and teeth are worth more, much more than those of a freeman which in turn are worth more than those of a slave. What Moses does is to create equality. An offence against a slave is to be treated as seriously as one against the highest in society. But for all its advances, Moses' law is still just as Hammurabi's code based around that old principle of retaliation. But then, around, three, around 1,300 years later, comes Jesus. You've heard that it was said, he says, eye for eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. The philosophy of retaliation has been binned. The rule book's been torn up in Jesus' upside down approach to life. At last it becomes clear God's association with the vengeance and violence of the Old Testament was never a true expression of who he was, so much as the result of his determination to stay involved with his people and guide them into a better way of being human. It's this very desire that at times meant God was implicated in, even written up as the architect of excessive acts of violence, even genocide. Moses, a late Bronze Age thinker, puts late Bronze Age words and morality into God's mouth and the problem is that some of it stuck. But now, Finally, the penny has dropped. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, ways, says the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, and then adds, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Over the last few weeks, I've been talking about how we best understand the Bible and today I promised that I'd begin to unpack what I think. So here's my principle, principle number one. It's a very common and hugely misleading error to think of the Bible as a book, but we all do it. The word Bible, however, actually means books or library. 
That's exactly what the Bible is, a library, a complex collection of historical documents written over the course of at least one and a half thousand years and representing various styles, worldviews, languages, cultures, opinions and agendas. As such, it contains numerous, sometimes harmonious and sometimes discordant, sometimes even contradictory human voices and perspectives. The way I see it, the books of the Bible contain the account of the ancient sacred dialogue or conversation which is initiated, inspired and guided by God with and among humanity. A conversation that charts humanity's gradual growing understanding of God's character, only fully revealed in the end through Jesus. It's this understanding that guides me as I read and interpret the Bible. Ultimately, of course, Christianity is about a person, Jesus, and the example of his character and life and teaching. They are to be our primary lens for our biblical interpretation. In fact, our whole basis for doing life. Through Jesus, for the first time in history, God's character is fully, accurately, and completely revealed. Or to put it another way round, if it doesn't look or sound like Jesus, it's not God. So, some questions. Does this way of understanding the Bible make sense to you? What questions does it throw up for you? And lastly, what do you think of my maxim? If it doesn't look or sound like Jesus, it's not God. See you next week.